The Red Room Riddle, Scott Corbett, Chapter 7. Twenty minutes later, we were walking along Fillmore Drive. We'd been following its curves and bends for a long time without coming to any Harkins Way. He probably made up the name himself, said Bill. Our anticipation of the helpless fury we would very soon be feeling was growing with every apparently fruitless step we took. The same fear had been nagging both of us all the way, the fear that Jamie wouldn't show up and thus make fools of us for coming. Now we had begun to fear that even the corner itself would not show up. Fillmore Drive wound down over the slope of Mount Alban and left the great mansions behind, entering a district where the houses were still large with sizable front yards, but not in the mansion class. Well, let's go to the next corner, whatever it is, and then let's head back before we waste any more time, I suggested, angrily determined to salvage what we could of a badly botched Halloween. Okay with me, but if I ever see that little twerp again, without that big mutt. But then, at the next corner, Fillmore Drive came to an end in a T intersection with another street, and the other street was Harkins Way. The corner was there, but Jamie was not. Of course, we were instantly furious. We glowered around us, and Bill fumed, I knew he wouldn't be here. I clutched at a straw. Well, I don't think it's 7.30 yet. We better wait till it is. Well, okay, but I'm not waiting one minute after, declared Bill. Though, how we would know when 7.30 had come and gone was a good question, since neither of us had a watch. Harkins Way was a quiet, backwater type of street, where the houses lost all pretensions of being upper crust and became plain and ordinary. If there were any kids in the neighborhood, they were not in evidence, and neither was anyone else. During the time we stood there, not so much as one car went past. While our precious Halloween was slipping by, here we were, wasting it on a, on a deserted street corner waiting for a nutty kid we hated who was not even going to show up. Next, it began to rain. Not sprinkle, rain. Now, we were really angry. Now, Bill, if he'd had a nail with him, could have bitten it in two with those horse-sized teeth of his. We huddled under the inadequate shelter of a bare-limbed elm and waited, first on one foot, then the other, while flash floods streamed down our slickers. This is the worst Halloween I ever had, Bill announced. This is the worst Halloween anyone ever had, I declared, and went straight to headquarters with my complaints. Darn it, God, I whined silently. An unusual way to begin a prayer, perhaps, but that was the way I felt. Darn it, God! Thou hast all year to make it rain. Why dost thou have to make it rain on Halloween? You will notice that I had at least picked up some proper prayer-type pronouns and verbs in Sunday school. I was genuinely miserable. It was not like a ball game. There were no rain checks for Halloween. You could not have a double header next year. It was now or never. And now it looked like never, as far as this year was concerned. I continued my prayer. And why didst thou make us meet that nutty kid and get us stuck up here on a corner in the middle of nowhere? No answer. The rain continued to beat down on us. Bill gave the tree a kick, just to get the kick out of his system, and said, Aw, oh, let's go. And then, just as we were turning to leave, here came Jamie through the pouring rain, strolling along as though it were the nicest fall evening of the year. He had on a raincoat and his same gray cap. Padding along beside him, also seeming to ignore the rain, was Major. A moment before, we'd been furious because we hadn't found Jamie waiting. We had felt like gullible fools. But now that he'd come, we felt even worse. 
Now that it was too late to do anything about it, we discovered how humiliating it was to let Jamie find us waiting and know we had been suckers enough to come. Had we spotted him soon enough, I, th I think our impulse would have been to hide, to watch him wait for us, and never let him know we had come at all. But by the time we noticed him, he was only half a block away, and we were sure he'd already seen us. The sight of him stirred us both into a rapid change of thinking. Seconds earlier, Bill had been simmering with frustration and defeat. Now he was instantly alert and planning our campaign strategy. Judas Priest! Here he comes, he muttered. Now listen, no matter what he has up his sleeve, just remember one thing. It's all a lot of hocus pocus. Just hocus pocus. Don't forget that. Hocus pocus. Hocus pocus. I nodded grim agreement, and we turned to watch Jamie approach. Bill handled the greetings. Well, it's about time, he said. What do you mean, said Jamie. It's 730, and that's when I told you to be here. Come on, I'll take you to my house. His glance flickered over us as though we were trophies. He turned to lead the way. We weren't going to come, except we knew it was going to rain and spoil everything anyway, Bill claimed, but that only got him another mocking look. This annoyed him so much, he tried his special sneer again, and he was never sneerier. Well, you better show us some ghost, if you know what's good for you, he warned, using a favorite threat of his. But once again, he was wasting his efforts. Jamie showed not the slightest concern. You wait, he said. We had expected a short walk to one of the houses close by, but after a block or so he turned right and led us back in more or less the direction we had come. I say more or less because the way the streets curved, it was hard to be sure. He pattered along at a quick pace with Major snuffling along beside him, and after a while he turned again, and then again, until we might as well have been blindfolded for all we could tell about where we were. The only thing we could be certain about was that we were back in the highfalutin part of Mount Alban, back among the high and mighty stone walls and the lordly mansions. <clears throat> Say, where are you taking us? Bill demanded finally. Don't try to tell me you live around here. You'll see, said Jamie. My house is as big as that old dump we were in this afternoon. It's as big and as, well, as everything. I'll bet. Listen, stop stalling. We're almost there. We were passing a long stretch of high stone wall covered with ivy whose wet leaves gleamed blackly in the rain. Ahead of us there was a break in the ivy around an archway in the wall and set into it was a door. <coughs> a solid wooden door painted a dark rich red with a rounded top to fit the arch. Like the ivy, it glistened darkly in the dim light of a distant street lamp. Jamie stopped and gave us a glance that was malicious with anticipation of our surprise. Home, sweet home, he said, and pushed the door open, changing the dark red outline into a pitch black opening. It was obvious he expected us to be startled by the door in the wall, and we were, but we were also immediately suspicious. There were, do there were probably dozens of such doors in the miles and miles of walls in that neighborhood. I had noticed two or three myself when we were looking for the haunted house that afternoon. It would be just like Jamie to lead us to one he knew was not locked and say that was where he lived. Did he expect us to take one look and turn tail and give him a good laugh as we tore away down the street? <laughs> home sweet home, huh? scoffed Bill. Sure, and I live in the White House. I told you my house was as big as that other one, said Jamie. You see if it isn't. Come on, what are you worrying about? You afraid of a garden? Follow me. Besides, old Major's here to protect you. Up to that moment, we had certainly not thought of Major in terms of protection. Motioning to us, Jamie strolled through the arch, and after giving us an, in an inquiring look that appeared almost friendly, Major went bow-legging in behind him. 
watching Major, I knew my comfortable suspicions were false. Boys like Jamie might bluff, but dogs did not. A dog does not trot through a strange doorway the, main, the way Major did, as though he owned the place. Jamie really did live here. The thought was profoundly disturbing. I looked at Bill, and his expression alarmed me, even though I felt a sickly admiration for the set of his jaw. Bill was going in. I didn't walk my feet off and waste Halloween just to chicken out now, he muttered, and with that I made my move. I might be scared, but I was more scared of being left alone. I darted through the arch a step ahead of him. I stopped almost as abruptly as I had started. For once inside, I could scarcely see my hand in front of my face. It was so dark. What light there was from the street narrowed to a slit and disappeared as the door swung shut behind us. We heard the soft thud of its closing and Jamie's satisfied chuckle. I could feel gravel under my feet and as my eyes began to get used to the darkness, I could see the path stretching ahead of us like a hazy gray ribbon, closely bordered by bushes and trees. A few yards ahead I could make out the dark outlines of an arbor. Where's the house? Bill demanded in a loud voice. I don't see any house. Don't you worry, it's there. Just follow me and Major. We could see Jamie as a small dark blur now, starting on ahead of us and and could hear Major's broad paws scuffling on the gravel. As we picked our way along behind them, we even began to see signs of light through the trees ahead of us and off to the right. At least we'll get in out of that darn rain, muttered Bill, coming along behind me. His tone of voice had noticeably relaxed. A glimpse of light made all the difference. Now that we knew we were close to a house, to a house with Jamie's father and mother and other everyday things inside, such as nice bright electric lights, my own courage made a spectacular comeback. I stopped worrying and began wondering, was Jamie really a rich kid after all? One of those rich kids who don't have any friends because they always act nasty and superior towards ordinary kids like us? I had seen enough movies to know what rich kids were like. Well. We could handle one of them. Whatever Hocus Pocus Jamie Bly might have in mind, he was going to be surprised. I was sure Bill was thinking the same things and feeling the same way, and so eager was I to show Jamie his tricks couldn't scare us that I didn't even hesitate when the path led us into the gloom of the long, vine-covered arbor. Walking into the arbor was like walking into a tunnel. Suddenly, the darkness was total and absolute. The path could have turned into a pit for all we could see of it anymore. But I could still hear Major scrabbling along, so I kept going, even though I did slide my feet ahead and feel around a little as I took each step. Whoosh! Something icy cold whished past my right ear with a whispery, hissing sound, and almost instantly Bill yelled, Hey! Something hit me! From somewhere up ahead of us, Jamie spoke sharply in a strange, shrill voice. Stop that! Don't be in such a hurry! His words made no sense to me. Who was he talking to? It didn't sound as if he were talking to us. All I wanted to do was get out of that arbor. I shot out of the far end of it with such a rush, I nearly stumbled over Major, who wheeled out of my way with a startled growl. Bill came walking out behind me, holding his cheek. And I mean walking, not running. Walking in his usual splay-footed, shoulder-forward way. It took a lot of stubborn belief in his own ideas and disbelief in anything else to do that. I wasn't hurrying, he squawked indignantly. He, at least, thought Jamie had been talking to him. I was just walking along, and something scratched me. Jamie's voice was silky smooth. Don't you know enough to keep away from thorns in a rose arbor? Thorns my eye. Thorns don't make funny noises. You pulled some kind of trick back there, didn't you? You got a pea shooter, I'll bet. And then, of all things, 
Bill's voice took on a wheedling tone. Come on, Jamie. Tell us how you did it, and I won't hold it against you. Honest. The trick of it, that was what Bill was always after. The trick of it. Of all the kids I ever knew, only Bill Slocum would have been able to take things the way he took them that night. He wasn't even scared. He was so sure Jamie Bly had worked some slick trick on us. But Jamie laughed and gave us back some of our own medicine. Funny noises? If you heard any funny noises, they must be in your head. You better see a doctor, he said. Come on, we'll go in through the porch door. Rain was coming down in sheets now, making it hard to see much. But what I could see looked good to me after that black moment in the arbor. We were in an open space, with the neat, fussy, geometrical outlines of flower beds all around us among gravel paths. And the towering bulk of the house was close by. Light glowed in a subdued way through the windows of a big, glassed-in side porch. Jamie and Major walked off ahead of us and, and were swallowed up in rain before they had gone thirty feet. The rain was pounding down so hard we could barely hear Jamie's high, thin voice when he called back to us, Come on! Bill took his hand away from his cheek. Hey, Bruce, is it bleeding? For crying out loud, how can I tell? I said, blinking at him in the downpour. I can hardly see at all in this rain. I was amazed, though, by what I could see of Bill's expression. He had a savage grin on his face, as if he were actually enjoying himself. I'll find out how he worked it. You wait and see, he promised. Maybe we're going to have some fun tonight, after all. Let's go, before we get drowned. I was so astonished. I said, okay, let's go. We put our heads down and ran for the house. <laughs>